My name is Steve Myers, and I want to thank you for taking part in this exclusive Monday morning interview with Jim Rickards, the financial threat and asymmetric warfare advisor for both the Pentagon and CIA. Recently, all 16 branches of our intelligence community have come together to release a shocking briefing that contained an alarming consensus. These agencies, that include the CIA, FBI, Army and Navy, they've already begun to estimate the impact of the fall of the dollar as the global reserve currency, and our reign as the world's leading superpower being annihilated in a way equivalent to the end of the British Empire post-World War II. And the end game could be a nightmarish scenario where the world falls into an extended period of global anarchy. Jim Rickards fears he and his colleagues' warnings are being ignored by our political leaders and the Federal Reserve. And we're on the verge of entering the darkest economic period in our nation's history, one that will ignite a 25-year Great Depression. Today we're going to examine everything he's uncovered, because the bedlam could begin within the next six months which is why every American should hear his warnings before it's too late. Jim Rickards, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure, Steve. Glad to be with you. In the early 80s, you were a member of the team that helped negotiate an end to the Iran hostage crisis. In the late 90s, when it was discovered that the Wall Street firm long-term capital management was about to cause a total collapse of the financial markets, the Federal Reserve had to turn to you in order to stop this catastrophe from plunging America into a recession. And then, after 9-11, you were tasked by the CIA with investigating potential insider trading that took place prior to the terrorist attacks. That's exactly right. The problem was the CIA didn't have any capital markets expertise, and why should they? Uh, prior to uh, the, you know, the beginning of globalization, capital markets weren't really part of the battle space. So the CIA engaged in some outreach. Uh, they recruited certain people, myself included, to bring the Wall Street expertise to the agency. This led to something called Project Prophecy. So what the CIA said, well, if there's going to be another spectacular attack, using price signals to determine the actions of participants in the market, whether it be terrorists or strategic rivals of the United States, could you spot it? Could you get the information and actually break up the plot and save American lives? This system you built with Project Prophecy actually predicted a terrorist attack that was thwarted in 2006. On August 7, 2006, I got an email from my partner. Uh, she said, Jim, we got a bright red signal on American Airlines. So she said, looks like a possible terrorist attack. We documented that. I was up at 2 o'clock in the morning in my study watching CNN, and all of a sudden, MI5 and New Scotland Yard emerged to break up this terrorist attack. They were arresting suspects, uh, removing files. So this showed that the system worked. Uh, it's not just good for predicting terrorist attacks, but also strategic attacks by rivals and enemies of the United States. For years now, you've been helping the Pentagon and CIA prepare for a rise in asymmetric warfare and financial threats. Because today, there are immense fears will be struck by, as you've described it before, a financial Pearl Harbor. There's now concern in different branches of the U.S. government. Historically in Washington, the Treasury and the Fed take care of the dollar. The Pentagon and the intelligence community take care of other threats. But what happens when the dollar is the threat? Americans generally know that the Fed has increased the money supply by $3.1 trillion. We have $17.5 trillion of debt. We have $127 trillion of unfunded liabilities. What are those? Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, student loans, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA. You go through the whole list and it goes on and on and on. There's no way to pay it. During the boom years of the 1950s and 1960s, every dollar of debt that was created, we got $2.41 worth of economic growth. So that was pretty good bang for the buck. But by the stagflation of the late 1970s, that had actually collapsed. So now for a dollar of debt in the late 1970s, we were only getting 41 cents of growth. So obviously that's a huge drop off. You know what that number is today? Today we only get three cents of growth for every dollar of debt. So we're piling on the debt, but we're getting less and less growth as that trend goes from two dollars and forty-one cents to forty-one cents to three cents. It's soon going to go negative. This is a signal of a complex system about to collapse. This really speaks to what you wrote about in your new book, The Death of Money. The title strongly alludes to this. The hourglass is now empty. You warn we're about to fall into a twenty-five year Great Depression that the stock market could plunge almost overnight 70%. You know, when I use the phrase 25-year depression, it sounds a little extreme, but historically it's not. Uh, we had a 30-year depression in the United States from about 1870 to 1900. Economists actually call it the Long Depression. That was before the Great Depression. The Great Depression lasted from 1929 to 1940, so that was quite long. The U.S. is in a depression today. 
A lot of folks might disagree with you that we're currently in a depression. That word brings to mind images of the 1930s and soup kitchens. Well, we have soup kitchens today. They're just at Whole Foods in your local supermarket because 50 million Americans are on food stamps. It's not that we don't have distress. We have enormous distress, but it's being hidden in different ways. The unemployment rate today is actually 23% when you calculate it the right way. And you point the finger right at the Fed, Congress, the White House. I actually was in a meeting in the Treasury and I said to the audience, uh, the Fed and the Treasury are the greatest threat to national security, not uh, Al-Qaeda, not some of the other threats out there, but right here in this building with this group, uh, you people are destroying the dollar and it's just a matter of time before it collapses. And I testified before the United States Senate about this. I warned the Senate, you know, maybe we can't stop earthquakes on the San Andreas Fault, but nobody thinks it's a good idea to send the Ar Army Corps of Engineers out there and make the San Andreas Fault bigger. But by money printing and credit creation and reckless monetary policy by the Fed, we're making the San Andreas Fault bigger every day. And when you make a complex system bigger, the risk doesn't go up a little bit, it goes up exponentially. So the risk is unimaginable at this time. The collapse hasn't happened yet, but the forces are building up and that's just about to snap. Your take, and that of many in the intelligence community, is much different than what we're hearing out of Capitol Hill, which is why the allegations you make in this book are causing quite a controversy in Washington. I was actually at a recent conclave uh, in the Rocky Mountains with a couple of central bankers, one from the uh, Federal Reserve and one from the Bank of England. They'll say things privately that they won't say publicly, and I was handed a copy of Janet Yellen's playbook. The Fed is trying to kind of use propaganda, lie to us about economic prospects, talk about green shoots, use happy talk to try to get us to spend our money. The Fed doesn't know what they're doing. Don't ever think that they know what they're doing. You can print all the money you want, but if people are not borrowing it, if they're not spending it, then your economy is collapsing, even with the money printing. So you can understand it this way. So let's say I go out to dinner and I tip the waiter and the waiter takes my tip and he takes the taxi cab home and the taxi driver takes the fare and puts some gas in her taxi cab. Well, in that example, my dollar had velocity of three. One dollar supported three dollars of goods and services, the tip, the taxi ride, and the gasoline. But what if I don't feel great and I stay home and watch television and I don't spend any money? Well, that money now has velocity of zero. I leave my money in the bank, but I don't spend it. Let's look at what's actually happening with the velocity of money. It's plunging. Uh, it's going down very rapidly. But compare this decline of velocity today to what we saw leading up to the Great Depression. Now, in the depths of the Great Depression, velocity was even lower. But if you compare what's going on today to what happened in the late 1920s, just prior to the Great Depression, there's a very striking resemblance so it doesn't matter how much money the Fed prints, the Fed is trying desperately to bend the curve. Think of it as an airplane that's coming in for a nosedive. It's crashing, crashing, getting close to the ground. The Fed's trying to grab the joystick and pull the plane up out of the nosedive and get it back in the air. But unfortunately, it's not working. We're heading for a crash. We've just covered a lot of these startling numbers, these signals of this coming Great Depression. Let me see if I can quickly put it all together. Nobody denies that we have a debt crisis in this country. But you're saying we can no longer grow our debt without causing our economy to aggressively slow down. We're barely above water now. So that's signal number one. Signal number two is this dangerous slowdown in our velocity of money. It's already plummeting the levels not witnessed since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Are there any other signals the intelligence community is monitoring that suggest this collapse is right around the corner? There are, Steve, there are a lot of signals out there and they're very, very troubling. Uh, one of the ones uh, I'm watching closely and I know people in the intelligence community focus on also because it, it covers so much ground, it's called the misery index. The misery index is when you take the unemployment rate and you take the inflation rate and add them together and then just sort of chart that. You look at the misery index today compared to the period of stagflation in the late 1970s and early 80s that Americans remember so well, it's actually worse. This can lead to social instability. Take this back to the Great Depression. The misery index in the Great Depression was at 27, but today it's at 32.89. Believe it or not, it's worse today than it was during the Great Depression. What happens as the Depression worsens? Businesses can't pay their debts. The bad losses fall on the banks. The banks ultimately fail. That's happened before. The Fed's there to bail out the banks. What happens when the Fed itself is in jeopardy? Based on these signals you've been tracking, the Federal Reserve is going to fail? The Federal Reserve actually in some ways already has failed. I spoke to a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve and I said, you know, I think the Fed's insolvent on a mark-to-market -to -market basis and this governor first resistance said, no, we're not. 
Uh, but I pressed her a little bit harder, and she said, well, maybe. And then I just looked at her, and she said, well, we are, but it doesn't matter. In other words, here's a governor of the Federal Reserve admitting to me privately that the Federal Reserve is insolvent, but said, you know, it doesn't matter because central banks don't need capital. Well, I'm going to suggest that central banks do need capital. Look at this chart. It, what it shows you is that the Fed has increased its capital. Uh, it's currently about $56 billion. That sounds good. You say, gee, $56 billion is a lot of money. That's a pretty good capital base. But that's not the whole story. You have to compare the capital to the balance sheet. How much in the way of assets and liabilities is that amount of capital supporting? When you look at that, it's a much scarier picture because the actual liabilities or debt, if you will, in the Fed's books are $4.3 trillion. So you've got $4.3 trillion sitting on this little skinny capital base of $56 billion. That's very unstable. Prior to 2008, the leverage was about 22 to 1, meaning they had $22 of debt on their books for every $1 of capital. Today, that leverage is 77 to 1. So yes, the capital has increased, but the debt and the liabilities have increased much more. Your warnings haven't gone completely ignored. In the budget he presented this year, Senator Rand Paul cited your work and how we've driven our economy to the edge of a Roman Empire-like collapse. In fact, we have footage of Senator Paul instructing Americans to listen to your warnings. Jim Rickards, author of Currency Wars, notes, the Fed is insolvent on a mark-to-market basis. The Fed has wiped out its capital on a mark-to-market basis. Of course, the Fed carries these notes on its balance sheet at cost and does not mark them down to market. But if they did, they would be broke. First of all, I give Senator Rand Paul a lot of credit. He's one of the people who understands the dangers here. But the problem is not limited to the Fed. It's infecting the private banking system as well. There's about $60 trillion of debt on the balance sheets of our banking system. For a long time, debt in the banks grew at about two times the rate of growth in the economy. But lately, this has exploded. Today, it's up to 30 to 1. In other words, for every dollar of economic growth, there's $30 of credit being created by the banking system. The whole thing's unstable. I can give you a very good example of this, and this actually comes from physics. If you had, let's say, a 35-pound block of uranium shaped like a cube, it would actually be fairly harmless. It's what we call subcritical. It's radioactive, but it's kind of tame. But now imagine you engineer it. You take that 35-pound block, you take one piece and shape it into something about the size of a grapefruit. Take another piece, shape it into something like a bat. Put the ball and the bat in the tube and fire them together with high explosives. That sets off a nuclear detonation. That destroys a city. The way it's been shaped and configured is what takes it from what we call subcritical to supercritical. Jim, are you seeing any signs that our stock market has reached a supercritical state? Well, unfortunately, yes, we're seeing a lot of signs of this. One of the ones that's really fundamental and really important is the ratio of stock market capitalization to GDP. Because you remember, this, the value of all the stocks in the stock market, that's supposed to represent the fundamental economy. It's not supposed to be off in a world of its own. But if you look at what's been happening to that ratio recently, it's going sky high. It's 203%. Prior to the recession, that number was 183%. Go back to the famous uh, tech bubble, the dot-com implosion of 2000. At that time, it was 204%. And if you want the scariest news of all, just prior to the Great Depression, that number was 87%. In other words, the stock market capitalization as a percentage of GDP is twice as high as it was just prior to the Great Depression. So that's a really good metric for saying, hey, is the stock market heading for a crash? All the data says, yes, we are. But there's another metric, another warning sign, if you will, that's even more frightening, which is the gross notional value of derivatives. There's a certain number of shares of IBM that are outstanding, but we know what that number is. But there's no limit on the derivatives. I can write options and futures on IBM stock all day long and all the other stocks on the stock market. And that's what's been going on. Now, the gross notional value of derivatives in the world today is over 700 trillion dollars, not billion, 700 trillion. That's 10 times global GDP. This collapse is unavoidable. So, you know, we ask ourselves, how bad can this be? Well, what happened in 2007, 2008, when the markets collapsed? We all remember the value of stocks going down, uh, real estate going down, housing going down, all that lost wealth was $60 trillion. The problem is now the system is bigger. So I would expect the lost wealth this time to be $100 trillion, possibly a lot more. We're in this critical state, getting close to the super critical state where the system implodes. But it takes a catalyst. It takes a flashpoint. There are a number of potential flashpoints I've investigated. 
Jim, in a few moments, I want to discuss the steps Americans need to take with their investments and personal finances to prepare for everything you and your colleagues are predicting. But now let's quickly focus on some of these major flashpoints. One of the key flashpoints we're looking at is foreign ownership of U.S. government debt. Now, this is a very important thing to understand. We all know that the Treasury has issued over $17 trillion worth of debt. The question is, who buys it? A lot of U.S. debt is owned by foreigners. Who owns it? China, Russia other countries, countries that are not necessarily our friends, but they can dump it when they want to. Well, guess what? That's actually what's been going on. Recently, foreign holdings of U.S. government debt have been plummeting. But it gets even more interesting than that. We talked earlier about the project I did for the CIA, Project Prophecy, and we said you can see not only market action, but rivals, enemies, terrorists, and others operating in financial markets. So we all know that Russia invaded Crimea in the spring of 2014, and Crimea is now effectively part of Russia. So let's say you're Putin. You know you're going to invade Crimea. You know you want to take over eastern Ukraine. You can expect U.S. financial sanctions. So what do you do? You basically mitigate the impact of the sanctions. Start dumping treasuries in advance so that when you make your move, and the Treasury tries to come against you, you've insulated yourself. So now you go back and look at October, here's Russia dumping Treasuries month after month. That was a clear signal that they were getting ready to do something to engage in financial warfare against the United States. But guess what? It's worse than that. We know the Russians and Chinese are working together. So is it any surprise that when the Russians started dumping, the Chinese started dumping also? Does the intelligence community have the ability to defend our country in the event that this escalates even further? Believe it or not, there's an intelligence unit inside the Treasury, and they actually have a war room. That tells you that financial warfare is here and it's real. So if the Russians are dumping, the Chinese are dumping, and the Fed's tapped out, Who's going to buy all this debt? Well, a mystery buyer has shown up. Recently, Belgium has bought enormous amounts in the hundreds of billions of dollars of U.S. government securities. So Belgium started loading up on treasuries, coincidentally, at the exact same time Russia and China began dumping theirs. It's not the Belgians. Uh, these amounts are bigger than the Belgian current account surplus. Uh, these are not Belgian dentists who are buying these things. Belgium is a front. You know, could it be the Fed itself? That's the point. Maybe the public doesn't know who the mystery buyer is but the national security community does. Now the Treasury operating through this war room and the Fed mystery buyer in Belgium for now have managed to prop up the Treasury market. It hasn't collapsed yet, but they're not gonna be able to keep pulling these rabbits out of a hat. There's a limit. This should be very scary because if the Fed's tapped out, we talked earlier about how the Fed's leveraged 77 to one, so the Fed's at the limit of what they can do. The foreigners are now dumping treasuries. And if no one buys, guess what? Interest rates go up. That'll sink the stock market. That'll sink the housing market. Higher interest rates mean the debt gets higher. So interest rates go up some more. So you start a death spiral and there's no way out of it. An attack on our treasury market is obviously a very serious flashpoint that could ignite this Great Depression you predict in your book. Let's talk about another flashpoint. What I call flashpoint number two has to do with the petrodollar. Can you explain what you mean by the petrodollar? It's basically a system whereby why oil exports are priced in dollars. Oil doesn't have to be priced in dollars. It could be priced in euros, Japanese yen, Swiss francs, gold. It could be priced in a lot of things. But in fact, the whole global oil market is priced in dollars. And I was actually very close to the birth of the petrodollar system. My first visit to the White House on official business was in 1974 with a small group, about five of us. We met with Helmut Sonnefeld, who was the Deputy National Security Advisor at the time. He was the number two to Henry Kissinger. This was at a time, you know, you have to remember, at the beginning of the 70s, oil was $2 a barrel. At the end of the 70s, oil was $12 a barrel. So this was an oil shock. The price of oil was skyrocketing. Inflation was getting out of control. There were gas lines. You know, certainly certain generation of Americans remember this very well. Well, we were in the White House talking about what to do about this. And one of the scenarios we discussed was the U.S. military would invade Saudi Arabia. We would secure the oil fields, create a military perimeter around the oil fields. We would pump the oil and set it at a price that was favorable to us. Now, we would give the money to the Saudis. We didn't want to steal their money. We didn't want to steal their oil. We just wanted to set the price. Now, fortunately, that plan was not carried out, but it shows you how desperate things were at the time. But what did happen? Why did we not invade Saudi Arabia? Well, the answer is Kissinger and the Saudis worked out a deal. And the Saudis said, okay, we'll price oil in dollars. So that secures the role of the dollar as the global reserve currency. But there was a quid pro quo. We agreed to guarantee the continuation of the House of Saud, the royal family of Saudi Arabia, and by extension, the national security of Saudi Arabia, because uh, they're a relatively weak military power and, and it's a bad neighborhood. 
a lot of enemies in the region, you know, starting with Iran and others. So the question would be, obviously, did this petrodollar deal work? And it absolutely did work. Once it kicked in, the dollar roared. This was the period, sometimes people call it the king dollar period, the strong dollar period. This was after Volcker and Reagan in the 1980s. But this only continued up to a certain period of time, up until you know, around 2000. And then since then, the dollar's been in a decline. So what could cause the fall of the petrodollar? Well, we're seeing it in real time. Think of the petrodollar or the dollar's role as a global reserve currency. Think of it as a three-legged stool. So here's the stool and it's got three legs. As long as the legs are standing, the foundation is firm, and the dollar will remain as a global reserve currency. But one by one, those legs are being pulled out. What are the legs? Well, the first one is Saudi Arabia. That was where the petrodollar deal began. Our side of the deal was we would guarantee the national security of Saudi Arabia. But lately, going back to December 2013, President Obama stabbed the Saudis in the back by anointing Iran as the regional hegemonic power. You know, the president has been withdrawing pe American power from around the world, and his view is, you know, well, we'll leave a friendly cop on the beat. Every sort of bad neighborhood around the world will have a cop on the beat. The president's decided that Iran is going to be the cop on the beat in the Middle East. They're going to be the heavyweight regional power. Where does that leave Saudi Arabia? Out in the cold. So now Saudi Arabia is saying, wait a second, you've undermined our national security, you've reneged on your side of the petrodollar deal, why should we hold up our end? Maybe we'll start pricing oil in gold or euros or maybe Chinese yuan. Because now, increasingly, Saudi Arabia is selling more and more oil to China. So the first leg of the stool has been pulled out. The Saudis are going to back away from the petrodollar because we're no longer guaranteeing their security because we're playing footsie with Iran. Second leg of the stool is Russia. Now, Russia is not a member of OPEC, but they are the lo world's largest oil exporter, one of the world's largest energy exporters, uh, actually bigger than Saudi Arabia. So even though they're not a member of OPEC, they also price oil in dollars. Uh, so they've signed on to the petrodollar deal in their own way. But we're now engaged in financial warfare. Russia's ready to fight back. And this is not, you know, classified information. This is being said publicly. Andrei Kostin, President and Chairman of Russian Vineshtorg Bank, VTB Bank, it's one of the largest banks in Russia. He recently said, it's time to change the entire international financial system that considers the dollar the key reserve currency. The world has changed. There was another member of the Russian parliament. He said, the dollar is evil. We will sell rubles to consumers of our oil and gas, and later we'll exchange the rubles for gold. If they don't like this, let them not do it. Let them freeze to death. So two of the legs of the stool, Saudi Arabia and Russia, have already been pulled out. The third leg is China, and that leg is coming out too. As far as Russia and China's role in taking down the petrodollar, this recent $400 billion energy alliance they signed, is that the purpose of it? Sure. Russia is the world's largest energy exporter. China is the fastest growing economy in the world. They need energy. So this is a natural partnership between the two. But the dollar is out in the cold. China is actually putting these yuan bilateral trade agreements in place all over the world. They're doing them one by one, but once there's enough trade, and enough volume in certain currency, it can become a reserve currency. These are all straws in the wind leading to the collapse of the dollar as the global reserve currency. Jim, in your book, you investigate how nations are now using gold as a financial weapon. Is this one of the most dangerous flashpoints? It's absolutely one of the most dangerous flashpoints, and here's why. A lot of people look at the dollar and say, look, you may not like the dollar, you may worry about the dollar, but you've got nowhere else to go. But there is another place to go which is gold. You don't have to buy treasuries, you can buy gold. And countries are actually doing that. So this is basically a global rebalancing of gold reserves. This is one of the things that the intelligence community is watching most closely. Uh, and China is our number one case. Here's why. China has acquired more than 3,000 tons in the past four years. Now they lie about this. They officially say they have 1,054 tons. The reason is China is using their own military and their own intelligence assets to acquire some of this gold in stealth. I recently ran into a senior officer of one of the major secure logistics firms in the world. Secure logistics, that means these are people who operate vaults and armored cars, so they handle the physical metal. They're not central banks, they're not government agencies. These are like you know, Brinks and G4S and Viamat. These are the big players in this field. One of these officials said he recently bought gold into China at the head of an armored column of the People's Liberation Army. In other words, he was in an armored car and had armored personnel vehicles bringing gold into China. I guarantee that did not show up in the official Hong Kong import figures. Now, why is China doing this? A lot of people speculate that they want to launch their own gold-backed reserve currencies to so take the Chinese yuan, back it with gold, make it a global reserve currency. That's extremely unlikely. That's not what China's doing. What they are trying to do is hedge 
against the collapse of the dollar. China can't prevent that from happening. What, what they can do is build up the gold reserves. This is known to the intelligence communities. This is not publicly revealed. What if it were publicly revealed? Now here's what global gold reserves would look like if the amount that China owns were actually suddenly revealed. This is a dagger aimed at the heart of the dollar. Jim, so far all of these flashpoints have involved China. Isn't this an economic suicide mission to attack America? There's something else here, another flashpoint that could melt down the global financial system. What if the U.S. doesn't bring the entire pyramid crashing down? What if it's China? Well, it could very well be. They have a highly leveraged banking system. But the banking system is just the beginning. There's also something called a shadow banking system. This is now a $7.5 trillion industry, and it's up 4,067% since 2005. This term shadow banking, it's starting to get play in the press. How would you explain it? If you put your money in the bank in China, they, it's just like the United States. They pay you nothing, you know, zero or maybe, you know, one quarter, one percent, something pathetically small. But they're offering these wealth management products that pay five, six, seven percent. Well, what are they? Well, they're actually, they take the money and they buy mortgages on worthless assets, inflated assets and bubble assets are going to crash. Before the crash in the United States, before 2008, new construction as a percentage of GDP growth, that was about 16%. 16% is a pretty big slug. But look at China. In each of the last three years, construction has been 50% of GDP growth. They're building white elephants, they're building trophy projects, they're building ghost cities. I've been to China. I was with the Communist Party officials and provincial officials. They were trying to get me to bring some businesses in. I went to one place near Nanjing. They weren't building seven buildings, they were building seven cities. Every city had a whole cluster of skyscrapers, luxury hotels, athletic facilities, housing facilities, high-end shopping, metro stops, highway access, and an airport to service all seven of these cities. This construction was going on as far as the eye can see. It was all empty, all of it. Now here's the point. In the U.S. before the crash, it took about 4.3 years of income to buy the typical house. In China, it takes 18 years of income well, if they're building apartments and co-ops and condos and people can't afford them, you know the price is going to collapse. One of the senior banking officials in China said, this is a Ponzi scheme. Those are his words, not my words. I happen to agree. But we all know what happens to Ponzi schemes. Eventually, you run out of suckers and they collapse. Once you have enough collapses, there's going to be a run on the bank. The bankers are going to say, sorry, we can't pay you. It's not our problem. Well, that's not going to be good enough. Riots are going to break out. What does it mean when the world's second largest economy hits the brakes? That's going to be disastrous for global growth. It's going to pull the rug out from under the sky high valuations we're seeing in U.S. stock markets. This is a setup for an entire collapse of the global economy. Jim, there's one more flashpoint I'd like to talk about. It has to do with a premeditated plan you believe exists inside the IMF and involves high-ranking U.S. officials to replace the dollar as the world's reserve currency. And it's not just my belief. This is actually documented. It's a 10-year plan to replace the dollar as the global reserve currency. The IMF released a report this year. It was called, get this title, the dollar reigns supreme by default. Here's a direct quote. The aggressive use of unconventional monetary policies by the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank, has increased the supply of dollars and created risks in the financial system. The dollar's status should be in peril. Reserve is nothing more than a savings account for a country. That's the amount of money they've saved. But the problem is when you have it, you have to decide what to do with it. You can't just stick it under a mattress, so to speak. A lot of people think that the dollar will prevail because there are no good alternatives. That's not true. The dollar is declining sharply as a percentage of all the reserves. Imagine if that continued. The euro comes up, Swiss franc comes up, some of the other currencies come up. That's one outcome, but there's another outcome that's probably coming a lot sooner, which is that we have a financial panic in the world and a central bank has to reliquify the world. Where's that money going to come from? It can't come from the Fed. They're leveraged 77 to 1. There's only one clean balance sheet left in the world. That's the IMF. The IMF, believe it or not, is only leveraged 3 to 1. When the next crisis comes, it's going to be bigger than the Fed. The only source of liquidity in the world is going to be the IMF. Think of it this way. The Federal Reserve is a printing press. They can print dollars. The European Central Bank has a printing press. They can print euros. Well, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has a printing press also. They can print something called the Special Drawing Right, or the SDR for short. These SDRs can come along as a new reserve currency. The reason they came up with the name Special Drawing Rights is because if they called it world money, that would sound a little spooky and scary, but that's exactly what it is. But here's the point. This may be a 10-year plan. We're not going to make it 10 years. This, will, this collapse will happen a lot sooner than that. So they're going to have to dust off this playbook and run out these SDRs and print trillions of them to prop up the system. Now, if 
The Fed bailed out private credit in 2008, and the IMF now bails out the Fed in the next financial panic. Who runs the IMF? Who's really in charge? Well, it's a nice crowd. You've got kings, dictators, communists. They're unelected, unaccountable. And this is the next flashpoint, really, the IMF taking over the world monetary system, becoming the central bank of the world, printing world money called the SDR. Jim, these flashpoints, the attacks on our treasury market and petrodollar, China's stealth gold run, China's inevitable collapse, even this alarming inside job to take down our dollar that's escalating at the IMF. You've only scratched the surface of what you reveal in your book, but really the most important message I took away from reading The Death of Money is that regardless of which flashpoint unleashes the 25-year Great Depression, folks need to understand it's coming, and coming quick. Steve, that's exactly right. There is a mission in this book, and it's urgent, and it's important. We're talking about a prolonged depression. We're talking about massive deflation, massive unemployment, rampant bank collapses, a 70% best case scenario stock market drop. This could all start within the next six months. Look at it this way. Americans right now are standing at the very bottom of a tall mountain, Mount Everest, Mount Kilimanjaro. About halfway up the mountain, there's a catastrophic avalanche barreling down towards us. Determining the one snowflake, the one flashpoint that's going to speed this chaos up shouldn't be our focus. Recognizing the severity of the situation and moving to safety should be. 